If you threw a thousand squirrels into a forest, it would have one effect. If you threw a thousand wolves into that same forest, it would have an entirely different effect. And it's the same kind of thing with our gut and with probiotics. And if we start looking at it more like that, it makes sense. I would love the opportunity to throw a thousand squirrels. That sounds like a lot of fun. So we've got to cover these probiotic myths because as probiotics and the microbiome are getting more popular, people are misconstruing the science and they're putting weird information out there. So let's set things straight on really common probiotic myths. The first one that I want to touch on is that probiotics only benefit digestion. Well, probiotics are going to benefit digestion, but that is, if you ask me, one of the smaller attributes of what they do. You see, we have to think of it like the skin, okay? We look at our skin and we can see it as a protective organ. It's protecting us from things, right? Things don't get through the skin. Well, our gut is the same way. It's just on the inside. Our gut is like a castle wall and our microbiome is like the artillery and like the soldiers that patrol and protect to make sure things don't get into our bloodstream. We just can't see it, so it's hard for us to wrap our brains around it a lot of times. Our microbiome interacts with every little piece of food that we consume. It's kind of like the matrix. I mean, if you have a low diversity, when you eat food, you only have so many different interactions that can occur with the microbiome. Let's just imagine for a second a grain of starch that comes through your gut. If you have 10 different microbes, well, you could really go 10 directions. You can go a few different directions. But if you have millions or billions of bacteria, you have lots of different directions that it can go. So it's hard to even fathom, but what we eat and the different reactions it can have and the interactions it can have with the gut biome are hugely determining how our body reacts to food. So it's not about digestion and breaking food down, it's about the chain reactions that occur with everything else after that. There's a study that was published in the British Medical Journal that demonstrated that a dysfunctional microbiome affects the short chain fatty acids, which have huge effects later on. For example, short chain fatty acids, which is what kind of food ultimately breaks down to and fiber ultimately breaks down to, well, that has an effect on our genes, on what kind of genes we express, on the transcription. So basically, who we are as people ultimately gets made up by our microbiome. The next one is that fermented foods are good substitutes for probiotics. I wish that were the case because I love kimchi, I love cottage cheese, I love yogurt, I love fermented foods, okay? But I do not use them as a probiotic replacement, okay? Usually you're looking at one or two strains and if you look at most of the research, it's all kind of stacked against those fermented foods as being a good way to grow your gut bacteria. The journal Nutrition published a study that pretty much came out and say you, you cannot say that consuming one kind of fermented food is going to grow XYZ bacteria. Okay, you could potentially say that it's going to help produce short chain fatty acids because yeah, you could eat some good fibers that are fermented and they're gonna break down and produce short chain fatty acids, but you can't really say I'm going to consume this kombucha and it's going to plant XYZ bacteria in my my gut. Are they bad? Are fermented foods bad? No. In fact, I think they're great. I just don't think that they are a substitute for probiotics. The next myth is that probiotics are only good when colonized. Now, I understand that probiotics, you do want them to plant in your gut and ultimately grow and, and culture and colonize. But that's not to say that transient microbes are bad or are useless. Transient microbes have a huge effect, especially when it comes down to the breakdown of food, okay? They can affect the pH, lowering the pH, making it so we can get more out of our food. And one in particular, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, one of the most widely researched bacteria that is out there, is hugely beneficial at breaking down what are called oxalates. So when you consume things like spinach or some of these other uh, vegetables and some, some of these nuts, well, they contain things that make it so that you can't absorb a lot of the nutrients. They're called anti-nutrients. You've got phytates, you've got uh, oxalates. Well, it turns out that lactobacillus rhamnosus can allow those to be broken down so you can get more out of your food. And that one doesn't necessarily have to colonize. That could be transient, okay? So it's a huge, huge thing. Lactobacillus rhamnosus is one of the components of seed probiotic, which is the one that I typically recommend. So people always ask, and I know they're gonna ask this video, what my recommended probiotic is. The one that I have been using as of lately is one called seed. Okay, so seed probiotics are really interesting because they are a symbiotic. Okay, so they have a two-in-one symbiotic where they combine a good prebiotic, which helps grow the bacteria, along with a good diversity of probiotics too. So they're really unique because they have a capsule inside of a capsule, 
so it can survive the hostile gut and it can get through it can actually do the job that it's supposed to do. So if you want to check them out, I highly recommend them. So Lactobacillus rhamnosus is just one of the strains that they have in there. But the thing that I like the most about them is they really are doing their research on not just having just super high CFU count probiotics with a bunch of bacteria in them. They have strategically put the right kinds in there so that they play off of each other and do what they're supposed to do within the body. So I highly recommend them. There is a link down below if you want to save 15% as well and try Seed, their daily symbiotic. And take a look, I mean, you can see there's the capsule inside of a capsule, really unique technology. So anyhow, check them out down below in the description and huge, huge thank you to Seed for being a part of this channel and helping support so we can create this awesome microbiome content. After talking about Seed, it's a perfect transition into that whole high CFU content discussion because that used to be me. I used to look at a label and say, oh, well, it's got the highest probiotic count, the highest CFU count. That means that's the best one. Well, <laughs> think of it like this. Your gut microbiome is a forest. If you were to throw some invasive mistletoe or something into your forest, it's going to take over your forest and your forest is not going to be the same forest anymore. It's going to change. Well, it's that way with high CFU count probiotics. Sure, you can have a bunch of one or two probiotics and put them into your gut, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be good. That means that you could get overrun. In fact, there was a study that was published in the journal Clinical and Translational Gastroenterology that found that people that had a mildly disrupted gut microbiome already that took high CFU count probiotics ended up having serious bloating as a result of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Perfect indicator that their bodies weren't able to handle that, and it didn't exactly create the balance that we were after. It's all about a balance. We want a diverse microbiome. We don't even necessarily want to have a high amount of bacteria per se. We want diversity because these guys need to communicate with each other and they need to do their jobs. Okay, They're out for themselves and they do their job, but if we have a bunch of one invasive species come in, it throws everything off. So high CFU count doesn't really matter. It's about the strategy and the science that goes into a proper formulation with a probiotic. The next myth is that all probiotics are the same. You go to a probiotic shelf at the grocery store and you might have two schools of thought refrigerated probiotics and not refrigerated probiotics. That used to be me. Oh, the refrigerated ones are better. Those are the ones I want to go for. The non-refrigerated ones are not good. That means nothing. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Basically what that comes down to is just different strains and different techniques. But the point is, is that all strains are not the same. Okay. When I started this video, I talked about the thousand squirrels and the thousand wolves. Okay. If you have a forest and you throw a thousand squirrels into that forest, a bunch of prey, you are changing the environment of that forest. You take that same forest and you throw a bunch of wolves in instead, the whole ecosystem is going to change. So the probiotic that you consume is so, so, so important because it's not all the same. Some strains affect how we use vitamins. Some strains, for example, will affect gamma glutamyl, which is a precursor to glutamate. So that literally will make you more calm because it will actually consume the precursor to glutamate, which is what would make you anxious. So bacteria can do that. And then on the contrary, there are bacteria that literally consume GABA. So by consuming GABA, it will make you more anxious because they are consuming what would normally make you calmer. You see what I mean? They're all different strains. They have different effects within the body significantly. We have to remember that the bacteria in our bodies, the microbiome, does not think about us. They do not have abstract thought. They are so basic. They do what they need to do to survive and they don't even think about it. It's just innate to them. So that means that some are going to consume GABA. Some are going to consume things that, it doesn't make them bad or good, really. It just means they are what they are and we get to reap either the benefit or the negative byproduct of it. So we can influence that by changing things, which leads me to the next myth that probiotics need to be personalized. There are a lot of good companies that are doing great things with personalized probiotics. But the thing is, is that we are so far, way far from the science that would allow us to really have personalized probiotics. We don't even know the tip of the iceberg with what the microbiome can do for us. So to be able to say that we can influence the microbiome in one specific way for a specific genotype is a little bit early on, a little bit far-fetched. Right now, what we need is diversity so that our body has the ability to go multiple directions. Okay, if we get stressed out and we need to change our, how we think and how we feel, we need to be able to lean into that. If we need to be focused in it, we need to be able to, we need to be diverse people. 
and we need to be accepting of all different things that we encounter in our life. And your diet can absolutely play a role in that. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and please, please don't forget to check out Seed down below and save your 15% and just, again, we're gonna be doing a lot of probiotic content together. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.